بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So we are talking about an individual who was very influential, very instrumental, very recent. Now, how many of you have data on your phones? Raise your hands. All right. Let's see which one of you can do this the fastest. You got to take your phone out quickly and open Google Maps and I'll tell you the letters to type in Google Maps and do that right away. Okay. Uh, Google Maps. Yes. Yes. Google Maps. And you're going to type in in Google Maps the following words. E-L-K-A-D-E-R. Let's see. If, what do you see? Okay, you see Iowa, USA. Everybody sees that? Okay, you see it? Anybody else that doesn't see it? E-L-K-A-D-E-R. If you have a phone, if you don't have a phone, show it to others, right? E-L-K-A-D-E-R. Al-Qaeda, okay? Al-Qaeda. What do you think this is? It's a city, it's a small city. It's a small town in the Clayton County in Iowa, very small. And it is named after a very particular individual. What really happened was when the founders of this particular small city, Timothy Davis, John Thompson, and Chester Sage, when they were having conversations and they were sitting, they said, we need a name of an individual that we can name this particular city after. And they had a list of candidates. Who are they going to name this particular city after? And guess what? Subhanallah. They said, the only person we can think of is one prominent figure that is alive in our times who was not even like, you know, dead or, you know, he had, he had done great things and he's passed away. He's still alive and his legacy is still being built. And they said, we're going to name the city after Amir Abdul Qadir Al Jazairi. And that Al Qadir is Al Qadir. <laughs> okay. 1846. So this was in 1846 when the city was founded. Okay. And they said that they decided to name it after the young Algerian who was leading his people in resisting the French conquest of Al Jazair or Algeria. Okay, when I say Al Jazair, it's Algeria. In 1843, a little bit earlier than that, uh, there was a person by the name of, anybody can read French? You're French fluent? Okay, come. See, you got to learn from kids, man. I'm not a French guy. How would you read this name? Uh, Jean de De. Uh, so, okay. I guess. You got the name. <laughs> That's how you pronounce the name. <laughs> okay. Jean de Do, right? A person, a very prominent figure. In 1843, he declares and he says that Abdul Qadir was one of the three great men living. The two others are Imam Shamil. During the time of Abdul Qadir, there was another person. He's our next person that we're going to do, Imam Shamil. Uh, he's from the northern areas. Uh, so Imam Shamil, uh, he was from Dagestan, the Imam of Dagestan, and Muhammad Ali Pasha of Turkey, or he was the governor of Egypt. These are the only people living alive on the face of this earth that are worthy of given the title, the noble men. And he says, sadly, all the three belong to the Muslim world. This is when? 1843. Okay. Now, who was this person? If you think about his legacy, artists, you know, think of like all the singers today, all the artists, you know, who are they rapping about? Anybody, like, come on, let's be honest. Most kids listen to music. We all know that, right? <laughs> you all have, so, so who are, wh who's the personality or individual people are talking about or rapping about nowadays? That's great, mashallah. Those of you that do. Or tell me names and personalities of individuals that are famous today that everybody talks about in school. Let's talk about that. 
Soccer players, sure, yeah. I got. I thought you didn't know anything. <laughs> That's great. That's exactly what we're talking about. Hi. Right. Yes. Who else? Huh? Kobe Bryant. He passed away. Yes. Who else? So all of these famous personalities, right? So what happens when they become famous? Other people, they write things about them. They talk and they do different things. So here's a really interesting thing. You had British artists, poets, who were writing poetry about Amir Abdul Qadir Al Jazeera. They were so inspired by him. They were writing poetry in English about him and his conquests and how great was he. Uh, people, they were so inspired by him. Have you seen people who name their dogs after Messi or you know their pets after these famous personalities and stuff like that, right? That whole culture, like naming their their pets after somebody who's so famous, right? Uh, people started, you know, if the horse would win, they would started started betting. So it's like if my horse wins the race, I'm going to name him Al Qadir. Like these, they, like this is we're talking about in Western countries. Like <laughs> these people are naming their horses after Abdul Qadir. Like you can imagine the amount of influence he had on their mindset and psyche that they were so impressed by him. It is mentioned that the people of Port Bordeaux, um, a small town, they were so impressed by Imam Amir Abdul Qadir Al Jazairi's character and his dealings that in the elections of the French election of 1849, in the French election of 1849, they actually placed his name on the ballot for the French president. He was not even French, <laughs> right? People were so inspired by him. And what you find, and in 2013, there was a film director by the name of Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone decided that he's, he announced uh, a production, a film uh, called The Amir Abdul Qadir, but due to financial reasons and whatever, they were not able to, to fulfill that and he still wants to, to, to you know, uh, produce that movie. Um, then what happens is uh, Abdul Qadir uh, Fellowship is a postdoctoral fellowship today in the Institute of Advanced Studies in Culture and University of Virginia. So there's a specific fellowship that has been dedicated to him. Now what you find is all of these Western world and people in the Western world, they're so impressed by him. Yet our Muslim community does not, Muslim community doesn't even know about him. Who is this person? Where was he? Where did he belong? Nobody knows about him. Uh, and, and, and that to me was very concerning. <clears throat> Yeah, there's another interesting thing. It says that Abdul Qadir, he was inspired by the admiration and not only from within Algeria, but the Europeans across the world would be inspired by his existence. The generous concern and the tender sympathy that he showed towards prisoners long before Geneva Convention. So Geneva Convention laid the foundations of how would you treat prisoners. Way before that, he was treating and he had a rule book. He was the only one that allowed, that had an official grievance system. A grievance system means if a prisoner was mistreated, the prisoner had a way to complain about the guard who mistreated him. And what happened is when he was in prison in France, wrongfully imprisoned in the town of Bordeaux, every single... <laughs> prison guard became a Muslim just through his dealings. The, they, they would appoint a prison guard within a week or two, the, the guard would just accept Islam. They're like, this guy is not like, he, is not, he shouldn't be in the prison. So much so that when so many people, so many prison guards, they started moving him around. They got scared. They're like, this guy is going to cause an internal revolution within the prison. So they would put him in a different prison. They would move into a different prison and move him into a different, constantly moving until there were some key influential figures like today, some you know, famous actors, famous you know, football players, tennis players, whoever, people that have influence, they started putting per pressure on, the, on Napoleon Bonaparte III and then afterwards they were allowed, he was allowed to be released. Now, I'm setting this stage for everybody so that we understand the greatness of this person. We haven't gone through his story, but you know, this is how the Western world sees him. 
Uh, there's books that have been written on it. Uh, if you type in the, the biography of Amir Abdul Qadir, uh, I'm missing the name of that individual. I, I can see it with the image. It starts with a K. <laughs> I just can't remember the entire name. Uh, but it, it, the book is available on Amazon. The, the Life of Amir Abdul Qadir. It was published in, I believe, 2013, a recent book. So this is who we're talking about today. Amir Abdul Qadir Al-Jazairi. Okay. Let's begin the story. You guys excited? Yeah. No? Yeah. You are? That's great. Who else is excited? No? Hmm? I, I need a lot louder excitement. This is not a good excitement. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yes. Are you, is that your excitement hand? Yes. I love it. That's great. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the state of France at that particular time, right? We're talking about in the 1800s era. So let's try to understand how the French people or how was France at that particular time. So France was in dark ages, okay? William Chambra, who was a, a traveler, a tourist, and he wrote journals. And he would write his travel journals, like you know Ibn Battuta, he had his travel journals. So he had these travel journals that you can look up. And he mentions that in 1813, when he went to Algeria, Al Jazair, he went in the streets trying to find a single person that he can find within the streets of Algeria who was not able to read and write. And he said, I could not find anyone. Every single person that was walking in the streets of Al Jazair in 1813 was a person who was learned. They could read and write. Whereas the country I came from, he's talking about you know, the UK and Europe at that time, he said, you could hardly find people that were reading and writing. So what that tells you about the state of the civilization that existed at that time. Uh, at point, Al Jazair was so rich that they had, they loaned to France thousands and thousands of dollars till this day France has not paid back that debt. That debt is still being recorded and accruing interest and whatever, you know, you know, international trade and all of that. So they still haven't paid that debt back. You know, they were so much in need. Yet, they wanted to invade this particular land. And the usual conversation that you hear in your schools is going to be, this was to colonize. We went to make that country a better place. We entered that barbaric environment, uncivilized, and we made it civilized, right? In 1813, William Chambra, he says that when I walked the streets of Al Jazair, I could not find anybody I mean, this is true, not, not anymore, but he's like, I could not find anybody that stunk. They didn't have a stench. They didn't smell bad. Whereas in France, you could not walk the streets of France because people didn't know how to clean themselves and they stunk. They had stench. That's why one of my teachers used to say, you know, if you go back and read history, it stinks, right? Because people didn't know how to clean themselves. They didn't have Islam telling them how to be pure and take baths. As, as a matter of fact, one of, a few of the kings, they used to pride themselves that they haven't taken a bath for a year. I'm serious. Like If you read history, they're like, I haven't taken a bath for a year. I'm the king. It's a great accomplishment that I've done. Or, or recently, you know, I, I watched a YouTube video where the guy's like, I haven't washed my, washed my jeans for four years. Right? This, is, this is a culture. It's like, you don't wash your jeans. I'm like, what? For four years? And he's so proud of that. He did an entire YouTube video on that. And he's like, and I only own one pair of jeans, right? So people commented, he's like, imagine what he's wearing right now when he's recording the video, right? Like <laughs> he doesn't have another pair of jeans, but he was so proud of that. So that stench, you know, it, they, people stink. And that's where the entire culture of colognes and smell came because they're like, we need to get rid of the smell somehow not cleaning ourselves, let's just, just put lots of ether on ourselves, right? To cover up the smell. So this is what the, was the state of France at that time. So a lot of people today, they're so impressed by, and I, I mentioned this in the khutbah too, like they're very impressed by this French etiquette. They're like, oh, you know, I, 
mission, cutting the fork and knife and stuff like that. But if you actually go and study France's history, they are people who hate Muslims. The root, like their, like their essence is entrenched in this element of making sure that they destroy Muslim lands. And I'll tell you what colonization means to them. So when they entered Al Jazair in 1825, after they won um, a naval battle that took place between the Turks and the Egypts, alongside the entire European fleets, they lost the battle. And they said, now the ports of Al Jazair are open for us to invade. In 1825, they invaded. Within one year, they controlled the entire seashore, France. When they entered Al Jazair at that time, this was a huge country. Uh, Al Jazair had over 125 or 135 mosques. I, I, I missed the number. I think it's either 125 or 135. And what happens is within one year, there's only five masjids remain. This is not colonization. This is not making the country better. Rest of the mosques were entirely converted into churches or stables for horses. Stables for horses. So they literally went in there to destroy a perfectly fine civilization. That's why, you know, if you tell all of these countries today, then they, they all talk about, oh, the Muslim world and democracy and all of that, right? Democracy is, you know, you can do whatever you want. But before you blame the Muslim world, get your hands out of our lands. Get your hands out. You have no business being in Iraq. You have no business being in all of these countries. Get your hands out of it and then do whatever you want. Like then let the Muslims see what they do, right? We're the most philanthropical nation. Like a, a recent studies, they found that in UK, we are the poorest of the, the denominations that exist in UK, different like, you know, ethnicities as Muslims or religions. Yet we are the most charitable in UK, right? Why? Because it's in our nature to give. We don't take, we give. So what you find is, this was the state. Now comes Amir Abdul Qadir Al Jazairi. So 825 is the invasion of France into Al Jazair. Abdul Qadir Al Jazairi was born in Al Jazair in the city of Mascara, Mascara or Mascara, uh, in 1808. He was born in 1808. In 1825, while well, he was still young. The invasion in 1825, when the invasion of France was taking place at that time, he set out with his father. How old was he in 1825? 1808. So he was born in 1808 and 1825. What was his age? 17. So he was 17 years of age at that time. Teenager. Imagine. He was a teenager at that time. 17, 16, 17, he embarks on a journey traveling all the way from Al Jazair to Maghrib to Egypt, crossing over from there to Palestine, Jordan, down all the way through Tabuk to Mecca as a 17 year old. Okay, let that sink in. Our kids don't even go to like, you know, <laughs> this. And, and you have no way of knowing if your son is alive or not. Right? No communication, right? So he goes for Hajj. Performs the Hajj, obviously with a group, he was not all by himself. Uh, and then in 1832, he comes back to Al Jazair. His father, Muhyuddin, he is aging, i.e. he's getting old at that time. And he decides that he wants to pass on the baton. He was a leader of the chieftain of that village. He passes on the baton to his son, Abdul Qadir. Now the, the, this baton is given to Abdul Qadir and he becomes the chief. At 1834, how old do you think he is? He was born in 1808. At 1834, how old is he? 25. No. 26. Older. Come on, let's do that. So, 1834, and he was born in 1808. So, 1808. 26. Okay, he was born, he was 26 years old. At 26 years of age, According to Hijri, he was 27. So at 26 or 27 years of age at that time, he was so renowned as a military person and his military prowess was known in, in the entire Al Jazair. And he actually went straight 
and started having head-on battles with French. But again, he used that guerrilla warfare that we talked about in Muhammad al-Khattabi's story, where you know you would have different, different small battalions and you attack, 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 and you keep the, the enemy confused where you're going to be attacking. And then Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi forced the French people to sign a treaty. Uh, the treaty was called the Desmil, this, yeah. Oh, you're learning about treaties in school? That's amazing. So ensuring that uh, he signed a particular treaty at that time, and that treaty gave him the, the power to be the ruler of interior Orhan. We're going to pray today at 8.15, inshallah, if you're here for the prayer. Uh, we're going to pray, delay the prayer. Uh, yes. Uh, it was called the Treaty of Dam Sheila. Okay. Uh, again, I don't know how you pronounce it in the French part, but in Arabic, that's how. And he became now the ruler of the entire province of Orhan. Okay? Okay, he became the province. Then in 1837, he convinced General Biju to sign another treaty, which was called the Treaty of Tefna, which was the greatest treaty that he signed. And with the Treaty of Tefna, now he became the... Unite, like undisputed leader of Al Jazeera, uh, Al Jazeera at that time. The whole interior and the Titiri province, these two giant provinces in Al Jazeera, and giant, like they're huge, size of Ontario. Like now he is controlling that massive land and he's got full power. And so this is happening 1834, one treaty, 1837. In 1839, the French cannot take him. And they say, you know what, we cannot, we cannot be bound by these treaties of these Bedouins. Who cares? Even if we sign them on the world stage, we're going to break the treaties. And they come in with full force and power. They walk in and officially in 1841, the giant like fighting breaks out in entire Al Jazair. As I mentioned in my khutbah, uh, Al Jazair has been has gone through so many Al Jazeera, you know, Algeria has gone through so many, so many catastrophes at the hands of the French and other invaders and, and the Portuguese at that time that it is mentioned that it is called the land of million shaheed. That's how many human beings have died in protecting. So and then what happens is the treaty Despite the fact that it was signed in 1839, the small nation that he formed, that nation comes to an end. And uh, General Orleans, despite the fact that the treaty was there and there was world pressure on him that do not break that treaty, he does not care. He comes in fighting and starts killing human beings. The fighting went so bad that in 1841, uh, the governor general at that time, he said, I will enter your mountains and I will burn your villages and all that is in it. And I will harvest your humans, harvesting humans, like cutting, you know, chopping pieces of the humans that you have. I will harvest them and I will cut down your fruit trees until nothing is left for you. So this is a warning that he gave to him. And at that time, what happens is Abdul Qadir he sees the, the massacre that is happening, which is that literally the French people, this is what they were doing. When they would enter the city, when they would enter a city, they would find women. And if the women were wearing earrings, instead of asking the woman to take off the earrings, they would chop off the ears of the woman and send those earrings to France. And in the markets of France, people would buy the, ear, the earrings that were attached to a human earring for fashion. This is what French etiquettes are, right? We sometimes forget the history that they are. And now you can understand why they have so much fear against the niqab ban and all these other bans that you hear about that is happening in Quebec. Because in the root of there, they might call themselves liberals, they might call themselves very pro whatever, but they are really, really afraid of Islam. Then in 1842, what happens is, that he loses full control of the town called Tilisman or Tilsiman, he loses the control. And they tell him that if you do not surrender, then we're going to start burning human beings, starting from children, then women, then old people, and then your warriors. We're gonna start burning them alive. So at that point, 
Abdul Qadir cannot take this anymore. His heart is filled with agony and pain that his people have to go through this whole thing because of his cause of defending. And a lot of people told him not to give up, but he's like, I cannot be a source of having all these millions of children and women being killed just because I wanted freedom for this country. So in 1847, what happens is Abdul Qadir surrenders and General Louis at that time, he promises him in exchange of his surrender, in exchange of him submitting to, to General Louis' command, he will be given asylum and taken to a Muslim land, either Turkey or Syria, based on his request. But as soon as that happens, as is the case, oftentimes colonizing powers, they betrayed their promises. Whatever happened in India and Pakistan, those of you that have read history, you know what happened there. All the promises, everything that was given and everything was broken in the next day, they did the exact same thing and they took him and they put him in prison. He was imprisoned at that time instead of, uh, you know, uh, being taken as a free person in the land that he chose, they put him in a prison and the French administration held him as a prisoner instead of taking him to the country that requested. Now, I mentioned that there were a lot of prominent figures at that time, too many to mention that actually started raising concerns about his treatment in the prison, how he was treated. And it is mentioned that there's actually a graveyard in France where all the people who followed him so all the prison guards who became Muslim because of his behavior and his character, all of them, they died and they requested that they be buried. And there's, I think, total of 36 of them. They're all buried in a particular graveyard in France and they have a, a monument on them honoring the, the fact that they were the you know, people who believed in Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi at that time. Uh, and again, I mean, they didn't have much religion, right? They accepted Islam and that's all this. So that, that's their way of you know, uh, doing that. So what happens is in 1855, uh, 1852, President Napoleon Bonaparte, he says that we have done wrong to this person. He deserves a lot more than what he was treated for. And then they, they give him a pension of 100,000 francs back then. You know, pension of 100,000 francs even today is pretty good, right? Like, you know, they gave him 100,000 francs back then as a pension for what the in injustice that was done to him by putting him in the prison. Then he devoted the rest of his life from 1855. He took up residence in a small town of Bursa in Turkey. And after that, he moved to the Amara district in Damascus, in Damascus, in, Damascus uh, in the northern parts of Damascus. And then he devoted the rest of his life writing books on theology, philosophy, philosophical treaties that have been written. Uh, they call the, the, uh, the defense of intelligence. There's a treaty that was written on that. He also wrote a book on Arabian horses and all the different types of Arabian horses. He was a very, like he was a, he was a, a very good example of somebody who was a theologian, who was a historian, who understood sciences. He had very good grasp on all different sciences. Now, the last part of his particular event and what we are going to quickly go through is in, and this is the story that I want everybody to take away. In July of 1860, a conflict, break, a conflict breaks out between the Muslims uh, and uh, the Maronites. It's a, you know, it's a subsect of, uh, of Christianity, not Mennonites, Maronites. So the Druze, and the Muslims with the Maronites and the Christians in Damascus, Damascus, they get into an argument and it's literally like a bloodbath. And what happens is around 3,000 Christians were killed in that bloodbath. Now, Amir Abdul Qadir, he hears about this and obviously he's defenseless. He doesn't have any weapons and stuff. He's only got himself and his fame you know, as a person. And he gathers 40 people and he opens up his houses and all the other 40 people, they open up their houses and his sons, Amir Abdul Qadir's sons, they were running around in the streets looking for Christians and telling them, you can just come to our houses. We've got safe haven for you in our houses. You can take refuge in our houses. One of the newspapers, many years down the road, almost nine years down the road, uh, Lisa Kel newspaper, uh, on 2nd of August, 1869, in the fourth article they write, they say uh, a portion of this long article, but it says, uh, we were in concentrations, surrounded. All of us, this is one of the survivors he's writing. All of us quite convinced that our last hour had arrived. In that expectation of death, in those incredible moments of gleam and doom and of anguish, 
Heaven, however, sent us a savior. Abdul Qadir appeared, surrounded by his Algerian 40 of them. He was on a horseback and had no arms. So people were killing with arms and he just entered. He was so handsome and such a an handsome figure with calm and imposing made such a strange contrast with the noise of the, the warfare that was taking place and the disorder that reigned everywhere. And he came and he saved our lives. Because of this particular thing, imagine Christians were the ones who kicked him out of the country. He would have said, you know what? Screw you guys. <laughs> you were the ones who kicked me out of my country. You're the Catholics who did this to me. I'm not protecting you. How dare you want me to protect you? But noble people, they stand for values. They don't stand for their own feelings. So he stood up against that. And it mentions over here that once this particular incident happened, the French government, they increased his pension to 150,000 francs. And more importantly, they bestowed on him the Grand Legion Honor, the highest honor that France could give at that time. He also received the Redeemer of Greece honor from the country of Greece at that time. From Turkey, he was given nishan e majid This was the highest honor at that time the Ottoman Empire would give because of this incident of his. The Pope of that time, the Pope Pius the Ninth, he gave him the highest honor that the Catholic Church could ever give to anyone. Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln at that time, the American president, he actually sent his personal, personal pistols that he owned that were handcrafted for him. He sent those pistols to him in an honor of what he did at that time. Till this day, you can actually have a glimpse of these pistons in the Algerian museum. And then Great Britain, they sent an entire treasure of gold to him for the effort that he did of defending those uh, innocent Christians. Abdul Qadir Al Jazairi, he wrote many books. I'll come to you. Abdul Qadir Al, Abdul Qadir Al Jazairi, he wrote many, many books. Many of those books today have been translated. Many, many documentaries are there on him. You can look up the word Abdul Qadir, spelled E L K A D E R. If you look him up, you will find a lot of documentaries in English. Those of you that speak Arabic, there's lots of documentaries on that. There's actually a, a, a 50 minute uh, biopic on him. So you can actually look that up too. But he's a fascinating figure for all of us because he lived in times very relevant to ours, right? He is not somebody prehistoric that we have to, you know, relate to and stuff like that. Uh, and then we already mentioned in the beginning that, you know, today the town of Abdul, town of Al Qadir or Al Qadir in Iowa, the state of Iowa in the town of Clayton, uh, in the county of Clayton is, is named after this particular person, right? Abdul Qadir. Sadly, there's not one Muslim town in one, I was searching for it, there's not one Muslim country that has named a single town after him, right? That, that just tells you the disconnect. As a matter of fact, what adds the salt to the story is that when they have realized that people are picking up on his history, they had to somehow distort his image. So now there's an entire, uh, you know, people are talking about speculative stuff that he was part of the Freemasons, he didn't belong and you know, this, this, and that's why all these honors were given to him because he was a Freemason, otherwise it would, this wouldn't have happened uh, many, many years after. Right? I mean, what happened to, you know, if he was a Freemason, people would have known back then, right? And a lot of the rulers of the countries of such, you know, Arab countries and other, other countries, they are in cahoots already with these powers. So they don't want this. So that's why many of the presidents of such, for the Algerian, Al Jazeera, Algerian president came out and said, oh, Abdul Qadir was actually a, a betrayer of the country. And he said these, you know, random comments. And why is that? Because when people, when, because media is, is spurring, now people can do all of these documentaries. You can't hide history anymore. And, and one of my, uh, you, know, what, you know, I have never met him, but I read a lot of the books and I, I get inspiration from him, Dr. Ali Salabi. He has a very nice video clip where he mentions that I, as, as a researcher, he's a historian, Ali Salabi, same thing, he was from Al Jazeera, he was kicked out of, uh, he was from Maghrib, he was kicked out of his country because he was very influential and he lives in Qatar today. So Ali Salabi, he says the following, he says, 
on the face of this earth, I don't know, like he's alive today. He says, on the face of this earth, I don't know of an individual that has read more books on Abdul Qadir al-Jazari than me. Okay, this is the Shaykh himself saying that. He said, I went to every single book fair that happened in the world and picked up every single book that I could find on him. And I read all of these books. And I've come to this conclusion that the efforts of distortion of his image that is taking place today in the Arab world, specifically run by you know, dominating certain type of rulers, they're putting out this propaganda because they do not want the next generation to be connected to this strong figure. Whereas the Western world is unanimous about the nobility and the greatness of this freedom fighter. And this was our hero for today, Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, inshaAllah. Our next week's story, uh, by the way, so reminder for the families, we are going to be doing this after Isha. So Isha is going to be at 8 o'clock. Try to be here at Isha. We'll pray Isha 8 o'clock. We'll try to start at 8.15 right away, inshallah. Today we had delayed the Isha. Those of you that are here for Isha, thank you for being patient. You know, time change and stuff like that. From next week, this will take place after Isha. And I'll take, you know, a couple of questions and we'll end, inshallah. Yes. Pistol is a gun. Any questions about this? Yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I read that. Then France at that time. Yeah. By the way, since you mentioned that, let me actually tell you a, a very interesting fact. In 2005, it's not in my notes, but in 2005, they passed a law which bans any person in France to talk about French colonization in a negative manner in Algeria. So this lecture would be considered a criminal crime in France. So you can just imagine how they're trying to pr protect their legacy. Uh, when? In 2005, July or like, you know, look it up. They passed a, a unanimous ruling in part. Uh, what concern do they have about, they're like, you cannot teach about the legacy of colonization in Al Jazeera in a negative manner, it's a crime. And that only tells you what they have to hide, right? And, and, and again, yes. We would be outlaws, yes. And sometimes it's nice to be outlaws. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You went to the back? Yeah, most French people may not hate Muslims. That's a really good thing. You know, people on the street who happen to be born in Quebec or other places, they may not. We're talking about people who control that country. We're talking about people who have, who have control, who, ha who make decisions. Yes. Uh, portions of it, yes. Yeah, and they still pay a lot. You know, uh, I, I don't know the arrangements. I didn't, read, I didn't read much on the, you know, I was re focused more on his story. I didn't read about the political arrangements between France and Al Jazeera, but we can look up. Yes, last question, we have to go for Adhan. Sorry, I didn't. End. How much does, debt does what? Oh, I think they took around $150,000 US dollars back then in debt from uh, Al Jazeera, which the, the French people never, yeah, you, um, in US dollars, but they, they never paid. They never paid back. You know, what's really interesting is Abdul Qadir, since you're talking about US dollars, when he became, when he established his country, which only lasted for like nine years, the Muslim country, he actually named, what do you think he named the currency of his country? No. No, Euro, no. No. Dirhams, no. He said, Muhammad, he named it after Rasulullah He said, I want the currency to be named after Prophet and his financial system. It used to be called the currency of Muhammadiyah. So you know, Muhammadiyah, that was the currency that was used. And that was the name of the currency, inshallah.